I'm Michael Weatherly. And I'm Cody DePablo. We're talking about Season 3, Episode 7, Honor Code. We also have a very special guest with us today in studio, Robert J. Wagner. We'll be talking about all things NCIS, Robert Wagner, and Anthony Denozo Sr. I love that guy. Yeah, he's the best. Welcome to Off Duty, an NCIS Rewatch podcast. Mm. This week on the show, we're talking Season 3, Episode 7, Honor Code. A six-year-old boy sees who kidnaps his father, a naval officer who works with a highly classified online encryption system. The boy calls NCIS, so Gibbs and the team investigate. This episode's release was November 1st, 2005. 2005 I, was such a great year. I love this thing that we do where we talk about extraneous phenomena from the day this episode first aired. Hit yes. me with your crazy information. Champion racehorse Best Mate suffered a heart attack and died while racing in front of a live television audience. Oh that is God. crazy. By the way, I grew up with a family that had racehorses and um, they did all that stuff. I wasn't a part of it, so that's why can it's I, so foreign to me I because it happened you, in South America. There, but, and I'm sure there was a racehorse named Ziva, but I know that there was a racehorse that won a significant amount of races called Denozo. Really? Yeah. You're very you proud go, of that. You Google it. Googleable. Uh, it's Googleable. Go to the next thing and I'm going to look Films, up Denozo. Films, Jarhead and Chicken Little. Oh, had yeah. their theatrical release. Chicken Little was such a cute little movie. I love that that's the one you go for. Of course. Instead the of discovery Charlie. of two additional moons of Pluto is announced. Ooh, that would be amazing. Well, I wonder what that means astrologically. And the album Greatest Hits is released, a collection of Blink-82's greatest singles. Michael, what's your favorite Blink-82 track? Um, the album is Enema of the State, and the song is What's My Age Again? Okay. Listen to it. Read the lyrics, and you will know that that was probably Anthony Denozo's favorite song, too. <laughs> so just so you know, Gibbs befriends a young boy after his father, a lieutenant commander, is kidnapped. The lieutenant commander has been working on classified project and is the one with a set of encryption codes, which could pose a serious threat to national security if leaked. Although the evidence gar uh, gathered suggests the lieutenant commander was part of a scheme gives his famous gut says otherwise meanwhile the team takes turns babysitting a six-year-old boy because i have a problem sometimes separating mark and gibbs and they're totally different people i know that but they're both to me very much father figures um the thing that people don't know is that mark is actually really good with kids remember like all the kids would come in and he would always take them and he would always kind of take them under his wing there'd always be like a knife that he would take out and he'd be like look at this and yeah. he'd always keep he'd them like, like very this is interested. a loaded weapon you want to no, so, here's a knife that. but hey, he was always have you very, ever had bourbon <laughs> <laughs> no, he was he was always really sweet to kids i was always like an observation that i made mm. like he 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 was a caretaker especially of the little ones and i do think that maybe that trickled into the character of gibbs and gibbs was very protective of course because he lost his little girl yeah, they're going to take care of you until we get your dad back. I can take care of myself. I don't doubt that. That informed a lot of uh, what we see that character um, go through in the many years of his portrayal. You know, like the protection of the little people is a big deal. Protection of little people from Gibbs. And unlike the, 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 the sort of space you're coming from, I saw Mark and Gibbs as two entirely different species of human. Like I saw them, and because what I saw from Mark Harmon when he was working with child actors was a deep concern for the, for the child actor. But you understand why. You know? and, and he had a moment, and I'm sure he would, he would talk about it if he were here, but um, where he was doing a movie when he was, you know, before NCIS, obviously, and he was working with a child actor. And... Um, Mark apparently had this very intense scene with this kid who had to have a breakdown. And he saw this director um, sort of save the last take for this little kid. And he wanted a very honest reaction. He wanted the little kid to kind of break, break down. 
And Mark was like, what, what, what is he doing? And at the end, he did something that was like unacceptable. I'm not sure exactly what he did to the kid, but he did something that really affected the kid, like psychologically, like it was just a, a horrible thing to see. And I think from then, Mark had a very protective attitude towards children on set. I he think really that's true. wanted to make sure that they felt safe, that they felt um, uh, loved, uh, you know, looked after. And because I think that was like a, a like a, a horrible moment in his career where he was like, oh, my God, they can do this to a child. You well, know? And Sean Murray was a child actor. He was also. And, and, and that's a very intense thing. It's a super intense thing. And I think that, uh, you know, I came to acting at 21 years old and some would say I never quite got there. But um, um, hello. It's a hard thing to believe if 20, you're sitting on that chair after 21 many years uh, old television episode. making a choice to become an actor as an adult, really, as a voting person, as a, someone who can buy alcohol. I'm of the legal age of consent. So, hello. And, um, you know, at 21 years old, you're making a decision after college about what you're going to do with your life. It's, it's an appropriate age. It's difficult when you're like, this little boy is six years old in this episode. I'm waiting for Agent Dinozo to ask me a question. What kind of questions was I supposed to ask? What I saw, why I called NCIS. He's now 25. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> so he's probably going to listen to this and go, why are they talking like, about me? Uh, no, he was... It, it, he was a pro, you know, and it's very, it's very weird as an he adult. He knew my lines better than I knew my lines. I'll tell you <laughs> well, that. That's not a lot. That's not a really, <laughs> that's not a challenge. But we also, um, in the episode with, with him, uh, learn so much about what Gibbs relationship to the boys. And we see a little bit of like the what protection. he's like as a father. And Tony talks about his father. There's a lot of father strands in this thing. Cody, will you introduce our guest? Oh, I would love to. Um, none other than Robert J. Wagner, who is a really special, dear actor to us. Did how many episodes? Many. Fifteen, many, maybe? Fifteen, or yeah. And, and how uh, many movies and how many oh my TV God. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm like a resume like you can't believe. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Wagner. Junior. Junior. What's the matter with you? Junior. Thank God you're here. Denozo. it's for me. You finally get to meet the real Tony Denozo. They've got the best ribeye in town. I don't like to advertise my failures. What's the fuss? I had a few drinks last night. Maybe uh, too many. That's all I'm guilty of. Did you slip me a roofie? Do something with this, Junior. Junior, when are you going to come to your senses and sweep this gorgeous creature off her feet? I love you, Anthony. I love you. I am going to start this very special episode. That we call our show Off Duty, RJ. You know why? Because you're off duty. I know. It's a simple well, title. Sometimes simple simple works. Simple works. So, <laughs> so this, Cody DePablo, this is our conversation. This with, is a treat and an honor. With Robert J. Yeah. Wagner and Jill. Hi, Jill. Yeah. Can you, Hi, guys. Hi, oh everybody. Look at Hi, Duke. Here's Duke. Hi, Duke. Can you see the Duke? Duke? We see Duke. Oh, look at Hey, you. Duke, you good boy. So good boy. Can I, I would just want to say, Robert J. Wagner, it is such yes. a beautiful honor, pleasure, privilege to be in your company once again. And I could just do it forever. I love being with you. And I know that Cody and I have not wanted to even talk about how excited we are that we get to talk to you in this way. Have you got that bottle of wine open? No, I, I'm still saving that for when you come up. <laughs> I'm so happy to be with you. This is a very in, in, a wonderful thing to do. Did you guys <laughs> ever think you would have this relationship? Because this started on NCIS. Mr. Wagner playing playing your father, but then I've watched this for many years. You guys became very close friends, and that's something that I don't think the audience knows. We became friends, but there's a core mystery between me and RJ that persists. From the very first time we met and worked together until today, we are still asking the same question. Do you, do you know what that question is, RJ? Yes. Are you doing me? Or am I doing you? <laughs> you're, you're right, though, Cody. You know, um... Uh, we have become very, very close and very good friends. And uh, 
I love Michael and uh, I, 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 uh, I love his family and it's been a tremendous uh, thing in my life to be involved with him. I love him dearly. But why, why do you think that is? Why do you think this kind of thing started between you guys? What, what was the synergy? What It was Michael's idea to have me be on the show. Oh, I didn't know that. And to, to be his father. And uh, Well, I hate to say, George I'm, Hamilton wasn't available. Please. Hello? Michael, don't, Hello. don't, don't, don't Hello? please. Hello. <laughs> I love doing the show, and I love being with you both. What both you, of you, you were great. And the chief, of course. And the chief. Well, you know, I, I had seen your work. I had been told about you, and I had seen your work because I was a very big admirer of, of NCIS. And, uh, and, and of Mark's, because I, I've known Mark for a long time, and I like his work very much. And he, he was wonderful as Gibbs. It was a great character for him. And um, when you had the idea of my being your father, you know, I, I knew about the show, and I knew about you, and several people had so, said so much that, that we look so much alike, I, that you look like my son, and I was very flattered with that. And, and we straightened uh, that out with my mom that you are not, in fact, my father. Yes. <laughs> we, did, we got clear on that. Because my mom tells the story in Lake Tahoe in, like, the mid-50s of she was a waitress, and she served your table, and she thought you had fantastic hair and nice oh, legs. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And uh, nice legs? And nice legs. Well, oh, RJ's RJ. still got nice legs. Let's not get started on the legs. So, Robert <laughs> Wagner, Please. sir, do you remember? Do you remember the night we met? I sent a town car for you, and I sort of screwed it oh, up. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. And we went over to With our John. friend's house, John McNamara's house. Yeah. John and Julie. Yes, that's right. And we and had her son. And we had dinner. David. And young David. And we had dinner. And we got to know each other that night. Uh, and it was before we had worked together. So when we worked together, I think it might have even been the next day, uh, certainly the next maybe Monday, we had already had this kind of celebration and, 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 and meeting and uh, maybe a glass of wine. And so there was a, a, there was a relationship too. there already. Yeah, you were so wonderful to me because... Uh, to walk into that show is like walking, sitting in a Rolls Royce, you know, it, uh, everything it just ran beautifully and you were so great. And, uh, you know, you can be a little bit nervous when you come into a situation like that. And, uh, I wish Cody had been there and have been better. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. I was so awful. <laughs> So, by the way, I was pretty nice to you too. <laughs> no, but let me, let me, yeah, let me you just... sure were. So I'm going to stop the NCIS memory for a second. I want to go back in the story of Robert Wagner. What was your first time on set uh, and your first speaking role and the first time that you had those nerves about being on a set? Well, you, you know, Michael, I was the test boy at Fox. Well, I wanted to learn how to be what it was like to be on a set. So it was a wonderful education for me. Do you remember any of the people you tested with that we might remember as well? Well, Joan Collins, I remember Beverly. Oh and God. she, Joan uh, uh, uses, uses the test in her show. She, because we kissed each other and, and uh, there was a little problem with the, with the, the lipstick and saliva and everything. And uh, they ran the, she runs that in her show. And when did you know you wanted to be an actor, like always? Uh, yeah, I did. I, I really wanted to be in the movies. And I finally got a contract on, at, to Fox. Uh, I, did, I did a screen test for them. And I was signed, you know, at, at that time, Cody, it was, the, it was the thing to be under contract to a studio. And uh, I had done the rounds to MGM and Columbia and Warners. And finally, this wonderful marvelous lady called Helena Sorrell, who was the, was the dramatic coach. She felt that I had something and she did my test. And, and with that, they signed me 
to the studio and I was under contract to Fox for 12 years. I started at $75 a week, take home 55 and I was in the movies and I loved it. That's how it was back then. You were, you were making money a weekly. You weren't like negotiating per movie or anything like that. You just were under contract and you got what they gave you. Yeah. 40 weeks, 40 weeks out of 52. Anyone, uh, watching this, listening to this should, um, press pause, go to Amazon and buy a, you've written several books, but pieces of my heart is such an extraordinary, um, uh, memoir and a real, uh, emotional piece of work. And I, I told you the story of when I was in Monte Carlo and I ran into Roger Moore who had written <laughs> a book called my word is my bond. And I, and I had to tell him that, uh, you had the better title. You, you are sort of an American you, James Bond. You've always been very debonair and it's uh, interesting that you were in the Austin powers series, but I think, <laughs> um, Mike Myers must've been thinking about you in it takes a thief and, uh, certainly a lot of other, jobs that you did. Um, was it takes well, a, a thief, you, the first broadcast contract you signed? No, the for television? Takes a thief was, uh, well, that was the first television show that I did. And I did that when I, because I was under, I was at universal and, um, you know, you're talking about bond. I'm, I'm married to a bond girl. I was oh. going to, I was going to bring it up. <laughs> How did you meet Jill by the way? Uh, I met Jill when she was 16 years old. Oh my Lord. I was doing a picture with uh, Debbie Reynolds and Bing Crosby called Say One For Me. And she came on the set because she was under contract at Fox and the Fox contract players could go and visit different sets and watch people work and hopefully learn something. And, and it was uh, all, it was all open. It was very much a family thing. And that's when I met Jill. And, uh, when I met Jill's mother, I said, uh, you know, I met Jill on the set of say one for me. And she said, yes, I know I have the pictures <gasps> and she had the pictures of one Jill and I met. Oh, and, uh, then we, we did a couple of films together. She was in the pilot of heart to heart and a great anti-dentite uh, Seinfeld episode. And yes, we did a Seinfeld episode and. And, uh, we went very, we've been married now for 33 years. And, uh, honestly, we, we look at each other and say, if anybody has ever told us we'd be married, uh, uh, we, we never had a romance until we got married. And, uh, that was a wonderful romance and it has been a great romance. You're a lucky man. And, uh, I am a very lucky man, Cody. I am very lucky. I've been very fortunate and I have, uh, we have three wonderful children and two grandchildren. And it, uh, it's been, I'm so grateful. I, I live in gratitude. Believe me. Well, we are incredibly grateful that you deigned to be an NCIS, uh, cast member. Federal agents, hands in the air. Junior, what's the matter with you? Put that thing down, someone could get hurt. But you did, even after I left the show, I have to say, I thought maybe you were going to take my place. After, <laughs> you, you, you kept going back. We, we celebrated the 10-year anniversary together in New York. You remember? And I you do. gave me that wonderful, you gave me that wonderful cape. Oh, Oh, I remember so talking to you on the phone and yes. I was living in New York at the time and you told me, oh, guess who I'm going to see today? And I said, who? Robert. And you told me you went to, what was Hermes. it? Uh, Hermes. It's an Hermes cape. Hermes. Like, Anytime you can get somebody a, a, a blanket. Um, That's a beautiful uh, one, by the way. So do you remember uh, at oh, all that's right. when we were shooting the, 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 the first episode, I just remember that it, Dad, what are you doing here? Hey, guys. Look who I found out in the lobby. Dad, what are you doing here? Ziva, show me some love. <laughs> it became a thing. It like, became, it became a thing. It became a thing. Yeah, the, the every dad, time what you, are you showed doing up, here? it was, Dad, what are you doing here? And it always had a different inflection. <laughs> 
but you, um, you were. but you uh, being very nice about uh, a well-oiled machine and a, a, a Rolls Royce like NCIS, but heart to heart, um, you know, as a kid, I really loved the adventure, the, the Nick and Nora intrigue and Max and the whole, the whole setup for heart to heart. Yes, I, sir. How there's, there's a lot of plagiarism, a lot of plagiarism there. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know if you ever heard of a show called CSI, but we went NCIS. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yeah, hello. But you put your stamp on uh, 80s television. I mean, you put your stamp on movies in the 50s and 60s and 70s and certainly television with uh, it, it Takes a Thief and Switch. And, uh, and you worked with our uh, dearly departed David McCallum on a TV show called Cold It's. Yeah, David and I go back uh, quite a ways. Uh, that was in the early 70s that we did that. Right. And... Uh, and then he did, he was on my show a couple of times on, on, uh, on, he was on heart to heart and he was on, uh, he was on switch and, uh, I, I liked him a lot. He was a wonderful man. And he loved his props. Our, our, our kids, uh, ha, ha, were together too, you know, in, in England. Can you and, talk about uh, the props? Because you, you made the mention of the props. I know the story behind this, and I think our audience would like to know about well, that David, statement. David, every actor enters their <laughs> process from a certain angle. And, some, uh, <laughs> some people, it's all about the dialogue. For some people, it's all about the hat or the hair. Some people are very concerned with their wardrobe. But David was props first. But you were the one that, that brought that up to Michael, right? Yes. Robert? Yeah, I, I, I mentioned it to Michael, and then Michael said, yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you remember? I mean, we, we both got into a, a, a sort of a laughing jag on that because he loved, he loved to get props and figure out things to do and make little things. And he was the perfect choice for that part. He was the perfect choice to play the, to play the duck. You know, the one of the great treats, RJ, about doing weekly television, which you did for a long time, 20 years straight, right? Yes, is I would say. Every week, every new episode is a new guest star, right? You've got a new, and, and you know, you're looking at whoever your co-star is, like Stephanie Powers and Heart to Heart or whatever, and you guys have to wake up and go in there, but it's the guest stars that really bring a show energy, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I, I think they, particularly after you've been doing it a while, and it's wonderful to have, it's wonderful to have one, actors come in and do, you know, bring their, bring their quality to the show, and it's so helpful, and it perks you up. You know, it's like, a, it's like tennis, you know, you play against a good tennis player, and you play a little bit better. Do you remember Joseph Cotton being on uh, It Takes a Thief, for instance? Yes, I do. And you brought some I do. incredible, it's, 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 you were really in charge of bringing some incredible, because of all your connections in Hollywood and, and how long you'd been working, you really knew a lot of people. Who would you say was the most interesting guest you've ever brought into a show? Uh, well, on It on a Takes a Thief, uh, when the thought of having Fred Astaire be my father, that was really exciting. And, uh, I had a wardrobe man who knew Fred and worked with him. And he was such a wonderful guy called Huey McFarland. And, uh, Huey knew Fred very well. And I, I and when, when the thought came up, I thought, geez, I don't think he'll, I don't think he, you think he'll do it. Do you think I should talk to him? And he said, absolutely. He said, talk to him. And so I went to, to Mr. Astaire, who I loved, you know, such a wonderful man. And I knew him over the years. And he was very, very encouraging to me when I wanted to be an actor. He was very, so kind to me and so wonderful. He was such a great person to me. And you did the and, Towering uh, Inferno with him as well. Yeah, I did. But, but him being on the show on, on It Takes a Thief, 
Oh man, that was that was the highlight of my life to have him at that time to be to be my father and for me to be his son. And he was the greatest thief in the world, and right. he was great. I loved him. Do you I feel loved like you him. learned something marvelous. about that? You know, meaning like at one point you came into NCIS and you became uh, Donozo's father and and Michael's very good friend. Uh, do you feel like you have to pass the baton, sort of from a spiritual, emotional standpoint? So you could make the next generation stronger, better, kinder, you know, all of those things as an actor. Because, you know, there are many people out there that could be lousy, you know, as people and very good actors, very good actors, but not generous, you know. And I think what you're saying is this man was incredibly generous to you. He was. I am saying that. And it meant a great deal to me. It meant so much to me. And uh, I was very close with him. We were very close friends. And uh, over the years, and uh, he was a special person. I, I, I loved him. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, Michael has been so wonderful to me. I, I don't know whether, you know, when, when I was uh, doing the show, I, we, had, we had a couple of very big scenes together. And Michael, on a, I'll never forget it, Michael, on a Sunday, his day off, drove out. I was living in a hotel near the set, so I didn't have to drive back and forth. And I had, you know, all my energy was involved in these scenes. And he came out and rehearsed with me on Sunday, spent the whole afternoon with me from 12 o'clock till till six rehearsing these scenes. And I was I'm ever grateful for that, Michael, because you made me feel so. I did not know that. And I can see that you're getting emotional, Michael. I don't get emotional. You do too. Your eyes are it, twinkling. It, it, uh, it meant so much to me. It meant a great deal to me. Well, you have meant a lot Michael, to me. Michael, I love you. One of, the, one of the first moments we were loading in the elevator to do a scene, you and I, you know, what, what I mean by loading in the elevator is when you go back to your one, which is where you start, and then when you have to get to, you know, it, we would walk into the squad room from the elevator. They loaded us into the elevator and closed the door. And you rolled your shoulders back, took a couple of deep, quick hits of the air through your nose, and you just got yourself centered. And then you looked at me and you said, let's show them the magic. Oh. (laughs) And I, and then all of a sudden, action, ding, and those doors opened. And you taught me something about, you know, generosity. Well, you're easy. You're yeah, easy. In a to lot be of ways. With. Hello. <laughs> my 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 relationship with you has meant so much to me, Michael, and uh, it's been it's been so wonderful to have had the opportunity to be with you and Cody, and uh, you were all so great. I'd always heard that it was a wonderful company, and uh, that's one of the reasons that motivated me to take the take the part of of, of uh, Anthony to know so senior the people on the show and the people involved with it were just absolutely marvelous and you particularly and Cody I love you both and what a way for me to sort of finish my career by being on the number one show in the world and with the two of you it's um, means a great deal to me. I don't think great, we I don't think great. we were the number one show until you you arrived. So I think you might have something to do with that, boss. <laughs> Which was season season that was season, season three. Seven. Season season seven was when we finally met Senior. Yes. Oh wow! But we talked about him for how many seasons prior? Oh, from the beginning, and the whole idea of Dinozo, the the character. So this is a funny story. Don Belisario. It, we're making the the JAG uh, episodes, which is the spinoff episodes. And that's how Mark Harmon and, and David McCallum and Polly Perrett and I were the four. Um, the core four. Core four uh, from the original. And after the two episodes aired, I flew to London and I was in this hotel room in Covent Garden. And I got an email from Don and he said, I'm trying to write this first script of the season and I can't hear your voice. You know, writers hear the, the, the characters' voices. And I, I guess I hadn't impressed him very much. You know, he couldn't hear 
my character in the scenes. And he said, I don't want it to just be run of the mill. Do you have any ideas? And Don asked me, you know, you, you have any thoughts on your character? Well, never ask me what my thoughts are on something. I wrote a 10 page email that was an exegesis of, uh, you know, high order. I talked about how Dinozo uh, lost his mother when he was a child. He was raised by his father who had been, it takes a thief, had been a kind of a con man thief and an unreliable um, male figure, which is why Dinozo became a cop, which we, which Don had already established. But I wanted to give all this perversity to the character and I wanted to have uh, build in all this conflict. And the central conflict to me for, for a young man is his relationship with his father. Right. Do you think it mimics a little bit of the relationship you had with Gibbs? Or no, were you afraid the, of I Gibbs? Think, Did I, you? I, Gibbs was a replacement father. But once you meet this guy, once you run into to Anthony Dinozo Sr., then all of a sudden I knew it was just going to be magic because you illuminate the, that relationship by coming in and being a little bit, you know, flippant and deflective and using humor as a, as a device to defend yourself. But underneath it, you see there's all this emotion and all this other stuff going on. It really, like, bravo to Robert Wagner. making You came in and found, you could have played it for laughs or cheap or shallow. Or, and I think you, you just absolutely hit it out. That first episode, you hit it out of the park so hard. You made my job harder, though, because then I had to live up to how amazing my father was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, you know, I, I think the basic thing, I think you and my son and I, even though we had our differences and we had our, our, there was that love, there was love there. And that was what I played. And I think that's what you played because I felt it. Right. There wasn't, what they didn't have was trust. Right. But there was love. But there yeah, was love. True. And, they, and that's what they yeah. had to build was that the relationship was the trust. That's very true. And I was you also always jealous we of your, I was always jealous of your hair. <laughs> just, just, oh, like, oh yeah. I never had that hair. Well, what's well, the, you, well, you, you're, you're a beautiful man inside and out. Thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> and so are you. What was oh, Paul and I Newman's, love you. what was this Paul is like Newman? just being a spectator for, for this like you love know, fest going you, on. Paul Newman was a pretty good looking guy, right? Oh yeah. Right. Do you know what his nickname, uh, on the set of a movie was? was for RJ when they did a picture together. Remember what he called you, RJ? Beauty. Called him beauty. <gasps> wow. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. When I mean, coming Paul from Newman that guy. calls you beauty, you know you got something going on the in the looks boy. department. Hello? So when I go to the gym, Hello? I, I turn my TV on and I have the classic movie channel on. And I have to say, once a week, it's Robert Wagner in... You know, The Hunters with uh, Robert Mitchum or, my gosh, what was the movie where you wore that crazy wig? Oh, Prince Valiant. Prince Valiant. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> with this huge back catalog of movies and a, a huge career in television, what to you is the primary difference between cinema, in the making of it, in the production of a movie versus the production of a TV series? Well, a TV series, as you know, is like uh, having a snowball following you. You know, you're running down the hill and you got the snowball behind you, you know, because it's week after week and some, uh, some people come in and some people go out and you, you have to keep, you have to keep your character uh, always. You have to have your, you have to have a knowledge about your character and believe in what you're doing because it's, it all, it's all happening so fast and the results are so quick. And I mean, you know that after spending, how many years were you on the show? I did 15, 13, 13 20? on, uh, 13 on 13, NCIS. 20. <laughs> but then he did bull. How many in bull? Six on bull. Yeah. I did 19, 19, 19 on CBS. Years. But so what's, what's 19 the, years. So when you're making That's a lot of work, Michael, it is. But when you're making a movie, uh, 
what would you say that your, you know, your memories are of that production style, which actually probably changed a great deal between the, the fifties and sixties. And when you were doing Austin powers. Well, you know, they have a, they have a board and they have, they know exactly where they're going. They know exactly how much time it's going to take. They know if something happens, what they can do. And, uh, you know, the, the way that production people figure it out, it's a miracle to me. It is, a, it is, a, but the snowball is a great image. It is actually really good. Just I kept on thinking of like the twin babies, like when they work with children, they just try to cast twins. Well, I, can I tell the story, RJ, about you and me and Tom Wright and the, and the, the child who's playing Tolly. Please. Who, who yeah. is, do you remember that story? Yeah, sure. Tell it. Well, do you want this was to, season? This, this was, was after I left. This was my last episode. Right, right. And we're sitting there, and Tom Wright goes, "All right, I've I've figured it out." And Tom is very specific director, and he says, "I'm going to put the the baby, the kid, the three year old, between you and RJ. You'll all be on the couch, and the little girl is going to be sitting, and she'll look from this side to this side." And I look over at RJ, and his talk about twinkling. You had a look in your eye, and I thought, he knows something. And RJ very diplomatically goes, Tom, can I make a suggestion? Do you mind if I make a suggestion? Just, and Tom, who doesn't listen to many people because he's got it figured out, he says, sure. What, what is it, RJ? RJ goes, you know, it's a great idea putting the kid in the middle but that kid's never going to do the same thing twice. And you're going to find yourself in that cutting room, oh, not being brilliant. able to cut back and forth between me and junior. What if we have the girl on the couch and me and junior are facing her a couple of dads looking at the girl, and then you've got all the freedom. And I watched Tom Wright go through the shot list that he prepared, all the work that he'd done, and he knew you were right. And it was the KG veteran, Robert Wagner. Ladies and gentlemen, oh, yeah. Robert Wagner. No, but that's you, a brilliant, brilliant movie. <laughs> do you remember that at all? Or is that just so oh, in, yeah. ingrained? Oh, sure. But part of what making television is you've got to be on your toes. You've always got to be thinking a little outside the box just in case and make sure that you're protecting not only yourself, but your other actors and, uh, you know, making sure that the director doesn't put himself into, into a, a problem. And you solved well, so many problems there. It was incredible to watch. Oh, well, that was a, that was a good day. That scene came out well too, didn't it? This belonged to Ima. And now it's Tully's. And that little girl was so cute. Both of them. Hey, we have a daughter. I know. What's her name? Dolly. Oh, uh, yeah. She's, how, how old is she now? Uh, 27. No. no. I don't know. No, she's like 12. Dude, I, I keep asking all the questions. I have to let Cody ask a question. No, I, look, I, it, for me, it's just a treat to watch you guys because I've, I've seen this relationship grow from day one. And it's, it's you know, it's like, I'm not going to mess with perfection here. I, I know how much uh, oh, you mean to Michael. And, and I know how much Michael means to you. So, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm watching this kind of love go back and forth and I'm just in awe. If I have anything to add, of course, I'll ask you. And by the way, I do have a little question. I knew, I've been, I knew there'd be one. Was, oh, yeah, there's, uh, I, what is the best piece of advice you've ever been given in this business? And mm, that's a big that's question. A big, big question. But, but, um. You know, you've had a long career, a, a mighty successful career, and you've been, you know, you've gone through so much in life and you remain so grateful. Uh, and, and to me, that's so admirable. But, you know, one of the best things I ever heard was uh, from Spencer Tracy, who said, uh, you know, involved with our business, in our business. He said, learn the lines, hit the mark, and be honest. And that meant a great deal to me, you know, it's kind of simplified everything because that's what we're all looking for as, act, as actors. And in life, you just want to be forthright, have empathy, be honest, be direct, be trusting.
RJ, when we were doing our first episode together, for the week, I think you and I were f- finishing uh, bef- right around lunchtime, right after lunch, right three o'clock. And we wrapped, and you said, uh, I, had been, I had just gotten a German Shepherd dog named Oriana, and she was still sort of a pup. She was about nine or 10 months old. And you said, uh, you know, I miss my dog. Why don't you, have you got the, the, the dog at home? And I said, yes. He said, do you want to come over for a little bit this afternoon? And I said, just to hang out? And you said, yeah, let's hang out. You said, go get the hunt and come on over and we'll hang out. So I go <laughs> bombing home. I tell Boyana, I'm like, I, give me the dog. I got, I'm going to go hang out with Robert Wagner with my dog. I'll, I'll, you know, and I was so excited. I jumped in my car. I drove over to, to your apartment and I went uh, into the lobby and said, the, the doorman said, Mr. Wagner is waiting for you. I send, so I get in the elevator with the dog. I come up, I step off the elevator and I see you in this beautiful red sweater down the hallway and, and you, you give me a little wave. My dog immediately abandons me. And goes uh, up to Robert Wagner and starts l- licking RJ's hand, and RJ gives him a l- gives her the love, and Oriana's going there, yes. <laughs> so I think, oh, I've already lost my dog. It recognizes a true. <laughs> so then we <laughs> go in, and Elizabeth, who was working for you at the time, and yep. uh, uh, and you had a, a, someone else there. They were just leaving the apartment. And we went in and you poured some water into a bowl and set it down for Oriana. And she looked at you like, I love you. And then you said, all right, (laughs) the dog is all set. Come with me. And you walked me into the living room where there were chairs seated across the coffee table and a, a groaning coffee table with all the meat cuts and cheese and crackers and little dips. And you'd set out all this food. And there was a wine glass in front of uh, uh, each of us, a bottle of water and a bottle of wine. And you said, would you like a glass of wine? And I said, I think I'd like a glass of wine. <laughs> so we, we poured the glass of wine and you held up the glass and you said, let's tell each other, let's tell each other the truth. And you were exactly what you were saying. Tell the truth. We're going to hang out right now. No bullshit. Oh, I would have loved being in that room. It was a good conversation. Oh, I bet it was. We were there until the sun went down. My dog sat next to RJ the whole time. I was (laughs) was like, Oriana, remember? Lost her. I had to put the leash on her to come with me. But we... Love that dog. But we spent some time together, and it just made me remember what you were saying about telling the truth. And that's that's what you said. Let's... Let's, let's did tell you the start truth. telling the truth? With Ro- Since then? With RJ, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so that applied. The rules other, only applied to RJ. Other people still got the runaround, but <laughs> RJ got the truth. You know what, uh, RJ? I have this, this wonderful memory uh, of you coming on to set and, and talking about your grandson and how they called you no-no. Remember? And, um, yeah, and I remember yeah, I was so. like, why do they call you? No, no. And I thought, oh my God, that's so cute. That's very Italian. No, no. You know? So I was like, oh my God, is it because it's uh. because maybe are you Italian? And so I started asking you all these questions and you said, no, it's a lot simpler than that. Can you tell us the story? Well, it's, it comes from uh, watching him. I'm going, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. And so he started calling me no, no. <laughs> So you, I was just watching. I mean, you, know, him. I, you just don't touch that. Nope. 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 No, no. That's right. Yeah. No, no. Oh my God. The best. No. Well, uh, I, I want to express my deep love. And thank you so much for taking time to spend with us in this from Dr. Oh. Evil's uh, secret lair where you have a bond girl <laughs> and a German shepherd dog by your side. But you are a beautiful man, and I love you, sir. Well, I love the both of you. You, uh, you mean so much to me, and the fact that you came into my life is one of the great treasures for me. And uh, thank you for all those nice things you said about me. And uh, 
I love you both Aww. with all my heart. I love you, Dad. Aww. It was a really beautiful conversation. I was checking my, yeah, I had to make sure that I stayed like on the trail because I get so emotional. But why were you getting so emotional? Well, because I think there's so much there. What a life that guy lived. Yes, but what why does life. it affect you in the way that it affects you? Well, I, you know, maybe I can feel history through him. Not just, uh, it's kind of like doing mushrooms or something. It's like he's my little psilocybin <laughs> daddy because all the walls come down and like you just have oneness, you know? Yeah. Okay, let's talk some fan questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all right. I'm all right. a very excited for the fan questions. And I don't know if you can tell, these are some pretty Robert Wagner glasses. I know. Hello. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, ask for you the question here. Hi, my question is for <laughs> Cody. If you had to change careers to something that is not acting, what would you choose? Probably something with real estate. Um, maybe, of, of course, the, the first answer would have been like a singer or something like that. Then, um, but if it's not in the arts, real estate or uh, psychology, I think anything that has to do with like understanding people, where they come from, I think that's a very innate thing for me. And it's something that I'm terribly curious about. It's a very different things, real estate, very, psychology. Totally. I like it. It's very good. All right. So this question is for Michael. Michael, big fan. You've spoken before about your career uh, being at a low point before NCIS. How close were you to giving up? And do you have any advice for others in a similar situation? Mm, very interesting question. I say with my FM podcast voice. I did reach what we call a nadir, a low point. Um, I was, you know, these things are all connected in terms of my, I was Scraping the bottom of the barrel uh, emotionally, I felt like I didn't have a lot of, in my life, I didn't have a lot of fundamental support structures that I could, that I could trust. And even though I was in a relationship before that I could have trusted, I didn't have it in me to do that. I, I, I was, um, and so it does come down to that word. I, I was not able to make sense of things. And I was not, I, mean, I don't think I ever became, you know, friggin' Daniel Day Lewis, but I was definitely not able to act my way out of a paper bag in certain ways. And I didn't, with that came to trust. I was self-conscious, not trusting the process, not trusting my own inspiration and my own things. So it's, it's that time when you're thinking maybe, maybe I should just give it all up. But I never had that actual thought. I just kept getting more and more angry with myself that I wasn't having a breakthrough. And I more and more and more angry. And I was... What would you do when that anger would pop up? I, I, well, I, Did you get proactive about it? Or did all you get... kinds of things. I mean, I, and I did just pour myself into uh, Denozo. And that was the breakthrough moment where I never did, I never had played that loose with my self and I never trusted myself like that. And it was, again, we've talked about it. I felt like I had a lot of support uh, from coworkers and from scene partners. Hi, you. And, um, and I found a lot, but I still didn't have those stanchions, those, those really fundamental, uh, cornerstone, um, foundations. So as I built up this house, I didn't have the, I didn't have the bottom of it figured out. And as I, as I, as you get up there, it starts to wobble, sink and wobble. Yes. I don't know if you ever lived in a house that it turns out it wasn't <laughs> built correctly. And so you had to do a lot yes, of, yes, I actually trusted somebody with the house oh, and they and did a horrible job. And now house, I have to... Right. So you know exactly what that, but, but isn't it about. funny, but isn't it funny how the universe has a, a plan because yes, at the time that was happening, I had to pay attention to other foundational things in life. Yes. And that's the thing that I couldn't miss because it was so obvious what I was going through that uh, I was almost being slapped with it. And I was kicking and screaming, trying to get my way out of this in the easiest way, the easiest way out. 
And the universe was like, nope, you are not going to go the easy way and you are going to learn the lesson. And the lesson is massive. Work foundationally on everything that you are. And it's intense because it kicks my intense. ass. It's intense. It's a lifelong pursuit. But um, certainly, if we could, uh, you know, we we're talking to Robert Wagner about advice. If you could, if you could, if I were to dispense any advice, odious as it might be, it's never stop working on yourself. I mean, well, that's like an everyday battle, right? Every day. Got to tend that garden, Cody. <laughs> <laughs> on that <All> right. note. <laughs> Should we go to the, um, have you ever had a, um, a plot line on the show that you just were like, went up to the writer's office and said, not doing it? Well, not plot line, but I think we all had moments that we were like, oh, well, you know, and it's fine. I remember thinking about this today. I went up to uh, the writer's room and I remember sitting down and I think it was like three people and, and I remember getting really, you know me, getting very animated, very passionate. I and at one point, well, <laughs> but at one point I realized that, um, and this happens to me also with my husband, I use my hands a lot and I point a lot mm. and he just looks at my hands and I feel very self-conscious because all of a sudden yeah. I feel like I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing, I know, it's but very... it's very cultural and it's very much who I am. Like I speak with my hands, I speak with my body, I speak with my face, I, I just, everything about me is speaking. And I remember having to say to the writer who I could see was taking offense, stopping myself and saying, oh, 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 you're, you're thinking that I'm mad. This is coming across as anger. And I remember at the time she looked at me and she was like, well, yeah, <laughs> and I just had to say, oh, no, 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 no. Um, apologies. That's not at all what I'm trying to do or say. I am very much passionate about the things I feel and it's awful because at times I have to make apologies for my passion. Yeah. That is really interesting. And I think it's a really good point because you, that's how much you care. And one of the reasons NCIS, uh, I think connected with audiences, there's always the question of like, why was it so popular? Why is it so popular? But I think in some not so small part, it's because we cared and we oh, poured we cared. ourselves into it. Now I will tell you the story where there was a, a plot where there was a, um, a, a, a woman who worked in the armory and she died, a young woman. And she loved everybody and everybody loved her, but there was one person she didn't like and it was Dinozo. And so everyone's teasing Dinozo, like, why didn't she like you? She liked everybody. And in the script, my line was, how could she not like me? As if like, because I'm Dinozo. And, right. and I went over and to a writer who was on the floor and I said, I can't say this. And he was like, no, it's funny. Like, uh, everyone likes me. How can I? I'm like, no, Tony Dinozo oh, doesn't within think. the context. Is... Tony Dinozo doesn't think anyone likes him. He's terrified that somebody might not like him. This is a confirmation of his worst fear. The only question in his mind is, why didn't she like me? That's the guy. And, it, and, it, and that's his sense of humor. Yeah. That's his need for attention. That's his... Are you getting emotional again? Sure. I'm a very Aww. emotional person. Yeah. But uh, so, so it's really not a acting out a storyline. It's acting out an in, it, it's when it doesn't line up with the intention, the, the truth of the character. Can't do it. You're acting, well, I mean, I, I had moments it. like that, which, you know, you know, very well, one of those moments, but air guitar. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I just remember thinking that's so not the character. And look, that was a yes. big, that was a big lesson for me. Because inevitably the showrunner wanted me to do it and I inevitably had to do it. He made me do it three times, different days. And, um, mm. and the last time he was just like, I want you to fully commit to this. And it's the only way it's going to work. And I did. And now when I watch it, I, I go, okay, well, the moment works, you know, but I, I also, I kicked and screamed regarding that moment because I just didn't think it was the character. However, now looking back on it, it's not the character, but it's the moment in which she wants to experience herself in a completely different way. Right. And she's trying something on. She's trying something on. And if there she's going to do it, she's going to fully, if she makes sure, remember, she looks around and she's like, is anyone going to watch me? It's the moment which right. she's like, is anyone seeing this? Is anyone going to like, you know, am I going to betray myself? So you found a way to do the truth in something that it, it was looking looked at straight on was not true was fundamentally not, not right. at all the character but, you know and a lot of things do happen like that well you, isn't you know, that true it is yeah boy maybe oh maybe Lord. this thing's well, maybe, maybe right. we should call rj all, all the time do, i it's feel very connected right now my yeah. god do we want to talk about a gibbs rule 
Will you do that? Yeah, go ahead. No, you do it. Okay. So, <laughs> Gibbs rule of the day, number 14. Do you know that one? Um, push the button, just don't push it all the way. No, but something like it. Bend the line, don't break it. Bend the line, oh. don't break it. Oh, suck it, suck it. Oh. <laughs> What? Wait, wait a minute. Why, I'm gonna what? Edit that what? Part out. I don't even oh, know. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Cody, where can I watch NCIS? You can watch NCIS on Paramount Plus and CBS. Next week on Off Duty, Tony and Ziva are where, Michael? Uh, we're in a fancy hotel. What are we doing? We're um, on a date. What do we do? Well, we. That escalated fast. Uh, <laughs> what do we do? We're kissing. Okay, we're, we're kissing yes, I remember and it's, that. It gets steamy and uh, it's very, very sexy. So don't go anywhere, folks. This is a milestone Tiva episode. Mm -hmm. I'm very excited about it. I mean, this off-duty thing is working out. It's season three, episode eight, Undercovers. Foo-foo.